All right, guys. Uh, welcome back to another edition of Dr. Martin um, tries to explain literature here in the most coherent and successful way. Today, I would like to start a two video series on the poetry of William Butler Yeats. Now, I don't know if you've ever read any Yeats, but Yeats is considered one of the greatest poets of the 20th century, if not uh, perhaps of all time. Um, his his work cannot be understated in terms of modernism. Now, Yeats is writing at a time when the world is coming out of World War One, and a little bit before that, when the world is fractured. The world is trying to find meaning in an ultimately meaningless existence. And what these writers and poets are doing is going back into antiquity to try to find some semblance of meaning. We see this in the realm of psychoanalysis. Freud is writing around this time, late 19th century, early 20th century, looking at archetypes with Jung as well, who's also doing this around this time, looking at uh, uh, ancient symbols, ancient thought patterns, classical Greek and Roman ideas for their modern contemporary influence on our collective unconscious and our conscience. William Butler, William Butler Yeats, uh, as I said before, is one of the greatest poets of the 20th century, writes a poem called Leda and the Swan. Now, Leda and the Swan is an ancient Greek myth in which the god Zeus takes the appearance of a swan. And this is going to be a pretty heavy trigger warning, but the swan rapes Leda. So Zeus, in the form of a swan, rapes Leda. Leda gives birth to Helen of Troy, Clytemnestra, Castor, and Pollux, I believe. I, I might have Pollux wrong, but I believe Castor and Pollux. Um, but definitely Helen of Troy and Clytemnestra. This poem is notable for its form. It is a sonnet. We'll discuss how the sonnet works in this poem, but also for the beautiful imagery over top of a very disturbing subject, right? And uh, as we go through, I, I want to draw y'all attention to that juxtaposition. So lead in the swan. A sudden blow, the great wings beating still above the staggering girl, her thighs caressed by the dark webs, her nape caught in his bill. He holds her helpless breast upon his breast. How can those terrified vague fingers push the feathered glory from her loosening thighs? And how can body laid in that white rush but fill the strange heart beating where it lies? A shudder in the loins engenders there the broken wall, the burning roof and tower, and Agamemnon dead. Being so caught up, so mastered by the brute blood of the air, did she put on his knowledge with his power before the indifferent beak could let her drop? All right, so pretty powerful stuff there that is kind of hidden behind really deft formalistic sonnet patterns. So a sonnet comes in uh, at least three formal forms, the Elizabethan sonnet, the Italian or Petrarchan sonnet, and the uh, um, uh, there's a mixture, there's a third hybrid uh, as well, which Milton wrote in. Um, but for our intents and purposes, we'll focus on this form, which is the Italian sonnet. Now, the Italian form is characterized by an octave of eight lines and a sestet of six lines, okay? And it is where the octave gives way to the sestet in a sonnet, in an Italian sonnet, that a great change occurs. That's where we know that the poem is taking on its argument. And we see that here. So in the first eight lines, the octave, the stage is set. It, the rape is detailed. In the final six lines, the sestet, we are let on what this ancient mythic rape of Leda signifies for world history. And this becomes important when we talk about the second coming, which functions as the far 
end of this act, right? It is the final consequence of this act. So if we think about this poem as the beginning of time, which we will talk about, or the beginning of history for Yeats, uh, the second coming represents the end of history, but that's for the next video. So let's bring it down. So the Italian sonnet form is written in A, B, A, B, right? C, D, C, D. So the first eight lines are A, B, A, B. That's the rhyme scheme. C, D, C, D, where C rhymes with C, A rhymes with A, all right? But then something happens, right? We get, uh, so we have A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. We have E, F, G, E, F, G, right? So that line right here should be brought up. It's called a hanging line. What that is meant, it's meant to go right here, but it's for effect, right? So E, F, G, E, F, G. So the, it, it changes a bit to give more of the argumentative pattern. So a sudden blow, right? We get this immediate... Uh, uh, coming together in midair, the great wings beating still above the staggering girl, her thighs caressed by the dark webs. Notice the adjective dark there. This is a very dark and heinous scene. Her nape caught in his bill. He holds her helpless breast upon his breast. So this, imagine this giant bird is, is, is assaulting this woman. How can those terrified vague fingers push the feathered glory from her loosening thighs, right? So how can she push him away? He's a god. It's impossible to do this. And how can body laid in that white rush but feel the strange heart beating where it lies, right? So there's a sense of communion in this, though, right? They are almost one. She is laying her body. She's trying to get away, but she's almost not resisting. She's laying her body against Zeus in the form of this swan, his white rush. Now, this is important. A shudder in the loins. Okay, a shudder in the swan's loins, a shudder in Zeus's loins, the act of consummation of orgasm. So the swan uh, reaches climax inside of Leda, fully penetrated. And genders there the broken wall, the burning roof and tower, and Agamemnon dead. So remember, this rape leads to the birth of Helen of Troy. And if you know your Greek history, you know that Helen of Troy is the reason for the Trojan War, right? Between the Trojans and the Greeks led by Agamemnon. Uh, Helen of Troy is captured by uh, um, the, the Greeks, right? Am I thinking that right? Yes. No, Helen is Greek. I am completely sorry. I, I messed this. Helen is captured by the Trojans. And uh, the Greeks are coming to retrieve her. And the Greeks are led uh, uh, by Achilles. And Agamemnon is the leader of the Trojans. Dr. Moore, I have to get my, uh, my history straight. I'm an English professor. And some of the... Uh, I wish I had studied um, uh, more mythology. But that's a failing on my part. So again, this, this rape leads to the birth of Helen, who is Greek, right? Zeus is Greek. Helen is captured by the Trojans. The Greeks are pissed, understandably, so they send Achilles and his men to rescue Helen, thus sparking the Trojan War, which results in Agamemnon dead. So indirectly, or directly, one could say, this rape of Leda leads to the Trojan War because it directly leads to Leda, and the Trojan War could not exist without Leda. Being so caught up, so mastered by the brute blood of the air, this is the most important two lines, did she put on his knowledge with his power before the indifferent beat could let her drop? So did she gain the knowledge of this god? Did she gain the wisdom of Zeus to carry her and thus Western civilization through history, right? Is Western history born of this violence, this rape? For Yeats, it is. This rape is the beginning of Western civilization, a civilization in a culture 
mired and bound by violence, which is understandable that he would come at it this way, just coming out of World War One, right? Or a couple years after World War One. Actually, it was, it was published in, uh, earlier than the thirty-three, but coming out of World War One. Hopefully, this clears some things up. We will talk about the second coming in the next video. Thanks so much, y'all.